thanks a lot to everyone for taking time to attend this lecture. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening, because we have guests from all over the world. I think Wolfgang has some friends in different countries. I have my own friends and also my previous MA students who are now in America and Canada. <laughs> so it will be people all over the world. Uh, I'm very, very honored and delighted to introduce Professor Wolfgang Tuber today to give us a lecture uh, on why discourse is not an object of science. I think uh, this talk uh, comes in time today because not long ago, we had a large scale conference entitled Convergence Conference. Uh, organized by the Center for Translation Studies. And I think the we now do have a consensus that we need the concept of convergence, that all the things, uh, all the disciplines, all the studies, whether they are similar or different, uh, we need all of them because we need all this to in, inform our uh, translation studies. So I think this is absolutely an essential concept. So here we come so today, uh, Wolfgang will talk a lot probably about more theoretical concept just now we talked about this and we know that Surrey University is famous for doing a lot of uh, practical um, training for MA students in translation technologies. And also our PhD projects are also very practical. For example, some of our PhD projects examine how uh, automatic translation or interpretation can be applied in different uh, uh, scenarios. So today I think it will be very helpful for us to listen to Wolfgang and then we talk about more about language study and we talk more about the theoretical side uh, of, of language. I'm sure that this will inform our current studies in translation research. Is that okay? Um, okay, uh, another few words about how important Wolfgang is. <laughs> Professor Wolfgang Tubert uh, is an eminent professor in corpus linguistics, and he worked, uh, I met, met him actually uh, around 20 years ago at the University of Birmingham. He was my PhD supervisor, and he uh, has been publishing in the areas of corpus linguistics, discourse analysis, translation studies, and media studies as well. And so um, he acted as the uh, editor of uh, the International Journal of Corpus Linguistics for many years. So very experienced editor, and I'm, I keep consulting him for many uh, issues that I need to understand about publication nowadays. So very helpful. Uh, and then, so I will uh, now uh, give the floor to Professor Wolfgang Tubert, and please um, have a, a very good discussion with him on any questions that you are interested uh, during or after the talk. Is that right? Okay, Professor Wolfgang, would you please? Yes. And the floor is yours. Well, uh -huh. well, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be back again in Surrey. I came here a few times in my lifetime and always got lost. And I'm very glad I found my way home finally, asking many people how to get out of it. So, uh, yes, uh, 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 in when I was uh, your age, I always were sitting in the back rows. Uh, I thought it's uh, so away from a speaker as it can be. But as I get older now, I'm a bit hard of hearing. And then it's better when I'm closer to the speaker. But anyway, since we all have these, uh, uh, these uh, loudspeakers, there won't be a problem for anyone. So yes. Uh, uh, I indeed I have been a corpus linguist. Uh, I'm still I'm not anymore a corpus linguist. I, uh, corpus linguistics look, looks at itself as a science, and as you can read, uh, I'm interested in language, but I don't think it's a science what I'm doing. So we, I will talk about that, and that is of course something uh, we are not concerned with when we are really doing our work. We are practitioners and we do something and hopefully come to an end. But it's also nice now and then to think about what we are actually doing. And uh, it, it seems that, uh, well, the trend is slightly changing. From uh, I was at a, a conference in, in uh, that was October, I think, or early November in Germany. And uh, 
the topic that was co uh, about yeah, uh, uh, linguistic uh, discourse, corpus. And there is a trend now to be observed to go from uh, quantitative studies also to qualitative studies, not to disband a uh, quantitative research, but to add to it uh, qualitative research. And uh, qualitative research is research that in this case at least cannot be called scientific in the sense uh, of science when you think of the natural sciences of physics or chemistry or mathematics. And I just uh, will try today to explain to you why I think that uh, we shouldn't look at this course uh, as, uh, well, an object of science, uh, but uh, as something that we can uh, well, try to interpret. What is discourse? What do people mean when they say something? So that's more or less what I'm going to talk about. It doesn't mean I'm against uh, 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 corpus linguistics uh, as such, corpus linguistics, the way it has established itself. And of course, these days, there are hardly any linguist working without a corpus. Uh, everybody has to validate their data. They have to start with uh, as much data as they can get. Uh, they have to validate it. And, and uh, that is what really you need to do when you are doing, when you're working in linguistics. But still, uh, I think uh, we should look at other aspects of language studies. Uh, so, this machine is working. It is, is it? Yeah, I come to my second slide. All together, by the way, uh, there will be, as far as I remember, 25 slides. So you, there will be quite a while. And uh, Wang Fang, or as she called herself, when I got to know her, and now she calls herself Fang Wang. So, uh, so uh, switching, uh, what do you want to say? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, in those days, she, uh, 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 I was a corpus linguist, of course, and and uh, I would have uh, probably disagreed with me with what I'm saying now. So, uh, but we get older, and I mean, it's an, always a moot question: Should you really like? Should you uh, should you really ask uh, people of my age uh, in the late seventies? still to talk to uh, to academics because I mean as they get older they get all kinds of funny ideas these old men so let's see what we can do today so yes uh, science uh, aims to show us reality as it really is it was uh, well what we think today is science was invented a long time ago in the age of enlightenment in Europe. And uh, then uh, people thought, well, apparently things are not happening randomly, or most things are not happening randomly. So we must find out about nature and find the laws that make things happen. And this is what science is about. Uh, so uh, it's what happens in the natural world. And uh, the question is, of course, discourse, is that the natural world or not? Is it something that uh, belongs to the natural world? And uh, I think uh, for the moment we should say, we should uh, well try to, uh, to pretend that it's not part of the natural world, but it is something that we created, that is something we, the humans fabricated a language and, well, and, and as it, happens it's quite useful for us humans to have language, but it's not something that uh, actually uh, comes with nature. People, uh, children, infants who grow up without anyone to talk to, they will never learn language. So it takes always being young people being together to learn a language. Uh, someone then have to have someone who's talking to them and someone they can talk to. So uh, science is explaining what happens in the natural world. Uh, and they try to explain it by inventing or discovering laws of nature. 
uh, there are mechanical this, uh, and predictable processes that science is about. And then again, the question is, do we have these kind of processes when we look at language? Uh, we don't do very much in terms of experiments. We do have observations and all our work, the work in science depends on applying a strict methodology. Strict methodology is, uh, has its advantages, but we shouldn't overrate them. So I will come back to methodologies a lot of in this talk uh, because everyone is, is tries or is advised to use a methodology when they do their research. But uh, I think one should look also beyond uh, the methodology when one is doing research. Humanities uh, is, it differs from, uh, from, uh, sci uh, from the sciences, the natural sciences, and that they don't look at the natural world. They look at what people do, what they say, what they produce. They look at artifacts. Uh, and that is uh, what makes it interesting because uh, to understand these artifacts, you have to interpret them. Think of a famous painting and uh, how many uh, art critics have uh, tried to explain, interpret what it means. Uh, the Mona Lisa, for instance, uh, with so many different explanations, so many different interpretations, and uh, no one, there is no agreement in the end. So there is not really a settled uh, 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 law what the Mona Lisa means to us. Uh, we are free in having new ideas, and that means we can remain, we can be creative and come up with new ideas. We can, we can think something that no one else has thought before. So uh, in linguistic, that means we look at what people produce in terms of speaking. They produce discourse. It's not always that uh, uh, linguists have been interested in discourse. Uh, you remember Noam Chomsky, he certainly was not interested in discourse, he was interested in the language system. And he thought the language system, the language faculty is something we are born with, and this is what he wanted to explore. Well, today we don't, don't know very much about this language system, this, uh, uh, well, this perhaps genetic ability to learn a language at some point. And uh, it's not so much in the center of our attention. What we are interested in is to look at language as it occurs. If you remember the famous uh, linguist Ferdinand de Saussure, he distinguished uh, long, the language system, from parole, the spoken language, or, the, or the, 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 the language as it occurs, the language as it is used. And this is what, for instance, uh, the corpus linguists set out to do, to look at language as it occurs, and so to establish what actually happens when language is being used. So in the humanities, we don't look at language as a science. Uh, we don't look at, uh, uh, well, any objective idea about it. We just look at what it means. And everybody, when they interpret what is being said, may come up with a different idea. And so there will be different interpretations. But interpretation is what tells us something new, something we didn't know before. Uh, we don't have to accept it. We can refuse it. We can reject it. And when there is uh, uh, someone is writing about a text, there will be 10 different interpretations and uh, no agreement between the 10 interpretations. And that's not bad because it gives us, uh, well, room to think uh, why, uh, in wide dimensions. And that's what I like about it. So the humanity, these are, I include here the social sciences. Uh, this is uh, uh, the human the humanity. They make try to make sense of concrete, institutional, abstract, and effective uh, 
artifacts or creations, paintings. Marriage is something that uh, is, of course, uh, institutionalized art artifact, something we agreed upon that it exists, and we changed our opinion on it at some points. And text is, of course, uh, something that we can even uh, uh, see in printed form sometimes. And grief is something, on the other hand, uh, uh, that we have invented by talking about it. And the question is what people feel speaking languages where there is no word for grief. Do they also experience grief if you don't have a word for it? Welcome to that. <coughs> so, uh, uh, artifacts you go together with intentional acts. You have, you are aware of what you are doing. You have an intention of doing something. It's not just happening. It's not nature happening in forms of a natural law, but you are free to decide what to do, what to think, what to say. And those are intentional acts. So interpreting uh, intentional acts uh, from an arbitrary normal perspective, that is what makes language studies, I think, even more interesting than just looking at the mechanical uh, side that has been being dealt with by, for instance, corpus linguistics. So, what is it that linguists do? What is language? Is it the language system we are actually interested in? Not too much can be known about the language system. I think we should be interested, first of all, in what is actually uh, being said. You know, there is no systematic way to compare two languages. Uh, you have to look at what is being said to be able to translate it into another language. I guess most of you are uh, translation students. So uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, there is nothing really in a system, a very systematic way that you have to, uh, that will help you to improve the translation you are doing. What we have to do, of course, I mean, there are, uh, 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 apart from the internal laws, there are lots of rules and, of course, lots of linguists. When I started as a young linguist, uh, then, uh, of course, I was searching for new rules, rules of language use which no one had ever discovered. Uh, how two words come together, or what happens when two uh, when two particular words come together, things like that. Uh, yes, uh, that is uh, uh, well a nice occupation, but in the end, we should know beforehand for who can profit from us in finding these rules, discovering these rules, finding the true meaning of language and si language science. Uh, is there anything as the true meaning of a word? I don't think there is. We make up a meaning as we go along. Uh, and what a sentence means or what a word means, a word, the word I will be discussing here is mostly depression. What the word depression means is something that we can make up for ourselves. And many people talk and say different things about uh, about depression. So it's not defining the true meaning, uh, but it's looking after meaning. It's part, trying to find what words mean. And there is no fixed meaning. We have to bear in mind that the words don't have a fixed meaning. Playing with statistics, of course, we want to do that. Measuring probability, that is what corpus linguists are good at doing. Finding what makes Chinese different from English in principle, I have no idea. Uh, or, uh, well, uh, how is a novel, how does a novel differ from, uh, from an academic paper? Well, that's an open question. Uh, no love affair, mostly no love affair within an academic paper, but that can might change over time. But what I'm in favor of is making sense of what people have said, uh, studying discourse, as an evolving human-made collective organism. 
composed of our utterances over time to understand us and the world, world around us. So language evolves. Uh, so we say something yesterday and somebody reacts to it and says something else. And today we look at it and say, well, that's not good either. We say something else. The language always evolves. And the me what was the meaning of the depression five years ago is not no longer necessary. Something new things have been said about depression. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to interpret what has been said in order to find out uh, uh, not about the world as it really is outside of discourse. We'll never be able to do that, but to find out what has been said about uh, the world when we talk about it. Linguistics, I claim, is not like physics. The object of science is the natural world, and science uses a strict methodology for calculating uh, natural phenomena. You detect things, you count them, you measure them, and then you have you know something what you didn't know before. And that is how uh, the real sciences proceed. And these, uh, it explains, science explains these phenomena in terms of nature, thus explaining their causal connections. It's a lot of, uh, of the uh, natural sciences is about causation. Uh, and we still don't know whether causation really exists or not, but we believe it exists. The object of humanities, of the humanities, is to study the creativity of humans. Culture, culture is what uh, comes about when people talk with each other. Without talking, there is no culture. Animals don't have culture in the sense that humans have, and humans have only culture because they talk with each other. The humanities deal with culture, <coughs> not with nature. They interpret human individual or collective artifacts material things like the sculpture or symbolic things like language or spiritual things like ideas about uh, heaven. Uh, interpretation is creative and free. And that is different from what the object of science is. The object of linguistics is language. And for me, language is a human creation. We can create new words, we can create new rules, we can give up old rules. So it's our language and we can do with it what we want collectively. Uh, and I can even try to, well, uh, make people say something new, use a new word when I'm successful in convincing other people that this is a good thing to do. So language evolves, it evolves in, three ways in unpredictable ways. You never can know when you say something whether it will be uh, successful in the, in the sense that somebody else will ever refer to it, what you have said. Most of the things we have said, no one ever refers to, unfortunately. And all these utterances together, they form our discourse. So uh, that is what we look at, and this is what we cannot predict. It never can predict what is said next. So the discourse is different from the human, from the natural sciences and that it cannot be calculated. We can calculate what's happening in nature, but we cannot calculate what's going to happen or happening in discourse. It's not an object of science. Uh, but also, more recently, people have started to doubt whether uh, science is as scientific as they always thought it was. Do people really make new inventions or find out new things about nature by always following, uh, following the uh, methodology, the established methodology? And uh, it seems that, well, it's good to follow the methodology as far as it takes you, but then to take off and make have your own ideas. And Thomas S. Kuhn, in the very important book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, which appeared back in 62, 
before I went to university, really, well, uh, uh, he showed uh, that uh, uh, that a lot of what we had uh, that well uh, physics had changed and, phys and and chemistry had changed over the decades, over the centuries, and this was two two revolutions happening in the science. There were some people said, well, by following by by following. Uh, 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 the uh, methodology, we don't get anywhere. We have to think beyond methodology because methodology is only a tool, something that helps us to do things, an instrument. But to get beyond it, we have to be free to throw it aside and think new ways. So uh, this is what Thomas uh, Kuhn talked about in his book. And, and there was also Paul Feyerabend who talked uh, in his book against method, that we shouldn't over, overestimate method, and that whenever something new has come up in science, it was because someone had gone against method, and this is the only way to come up to invent something new, or the most common way to invent something new. So, uh, some of the people, I think, online uh, listening to this lecture, they are corpus linguists, aren't they? Uh, let's hope so. So I, I say a few words about corpus linguistics. Uh, so, it's, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, I'm supposed to talk. One and a half hours, am I not? Oh, yeah. it, doesn't matter. it doesn't matter, but but that's what you expect me to do. Yeah. Anyway, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Yes. So yes, uh, I hope I'm still in um, yes. So uh corpus linguistics uh, wa was invented basically in the nineteen seventies by John Sinclair. And some of you may have heard the name. Uh, uh, so I, unfortunately. Uh, uh, Sinclair, John Sinclair, he died about 10 years ago. But he was the first one really to come up with a real corpus linguistics project. Uh, and this was written down in his book, uh, English Language Studies. Uh, that was a, 19, a project of 1970 that he carried out mostly in Edinburgh, for the last part in, in Birmingham. And uh, he was trying like everyone else in those days, in the 70s, in the 60s, everyone thought, well, now with the arrival, with the advent of the computer, most of our problems will be solved. We just throw them into the computer, and then the results kind of will be told. And uh, so he was very keen on using a computer, and corpus linguistics is based on using computers. You want to have to look at as much real language data as you can imagine, as much as you can get. And then you throw them in the computer, and the computer tells you, make, uh, tells you uh, what it finds. And uh, for instance, how many of these words are nouns, how many of these words are adjectives, but how does the computer know what a noun is or what? Uh, 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 the thing is, uh, it's not so easy that these things actually exist. What a noun is, is something we have to define. And I think there are about 37 different definitions of what a noun is. That's true for all the other uh, word, cl word classes. Uh, uh, and uh, this is what makes it a bit problematic, uh, corpus linguistics because we bring in our intuition. We think, well, this must be a noun. And so uh, we tell the computer, you have to look at it as a noun. So it's not any more objective what the computer does. There's a lot of our intuition going into it. And we might like our intuition, but it could also lead us in the wrong direction. But at least John Sinclair, he was looking at language in use, at discourse. And that distinguishes him from Noam Chomsky, who was not looking at language in, in use, 
was not looking at discourse, he was looking uh, at language as a system. He never looked at real language, real occurring language. So that's a do, two scientific ways of looking at language. And I think we have to uh, agree that either of them is, is full of intuition and that it's not nearly as objective the results we get as we hope they are. But it was uh, remarkably useful uh, in the beginning. Uh, there was uh, the focus was corpus with lexicography. And before uh, this was around, because before lexicographers had a corpus to look at, well, what did they do when they wanted to write a new dictionary and give the meaning of a word like depression? Well, they would look at existing dictionaries and usually copy what's there. And then they might have their own idea which they would add to it. And that would be the, uh, a rather subjective way of describing the meaning of depression. Now, with the arrival of the la of this large language corpus, which wasn't in those days actually as large as you think it might have been, wasn't, I think, more than a million words or so, <laughs> a few million words. Well, uh, with the, then you had still human lexicographers. You needed human lexicographers. And they could look at the evidence, at the textual evidence, and then make up their mind. So once again, Part of it is, well, let's say, uh, covered by, by methodology. There's methodology, but there is also a part where we interpret the evidence. So it's two parts. It's a more scientific part, or a methodological part, and there is a free part, an interpretive part. So, uh, at least, I mean, the goals were the description of language in use. In those previous days, uh, dictionaries and also grammar books often had been prescriptive, telling us how to do it, not regardless of whether people actually did it. Uh, and uh, the approach of corpus linguistics was for a long time just synchronic, just looking at the data without looking at what has been said when. Was it said 10 years ago or was it said now? And that is something that changed later to a certain amount, but, but not very much. But then they found, well, they didn't get any further. And then they engaged, corporate linguistics engaged in, uh, uh, in social studies, in discourse as a part of social studies and looked at uh, well, what people actually said and what it meant, what people said. And that is when corpus linguistic was only used for the first part to establish, uh, uh, to make us aware of what there is in the corpus, of what there is in discourse, what people actually say. And not the second part, where we then try to make sense of what people say. And now we have a, a discourse analysis that is based more on hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the, well, the craft or the art of interpretation. And that is, I think, what I want to stress here as the other and perhaps more relevant part of linguistics, not the methodical part, but the interpretive part of linguistics. So, uh, we want to add a qualitative uh, approach to the quali quantitative approach as it was developed in corpus linguistics. Uh, how did linguistics, I mean, perhaps an interesting question for the most, doesn't lead anywhere, but how did linguistics become a sci science anywhere? Anyway, in the, in the beginning, it was not dealt with as a science. Uh, still in the 19th century, it was still called philology, and some people even in the 20th century called it philology. Uh, and it belonged to the artus liberalis, uh, to the free arts, of, uh, to, to the humanities, now what you now call the humanities. Uh, the pursuits of uh, educated persons in Oxford or Cambridge, 
uh, with plenty of leisure time and no need to learn anything special, <clears throat> no, practi no practical things. So they looked at languages and tried to find, well, uh, interesting things, uh, how one word corresponds to another word and things like that. But at the end of the century, of the 19th century, so 120 years ago, well, uh, this was a time when they were preparing, already beginning to prepare for the First World War. Uh, so uh, they thought money should only go in uh, in the sciences, where we can invent new weapons or something, uh, sciences and engineering sciences. So this is where the money went. And uh, this uh, great uh, early linguist, Ferdinand de Saussure, he quickly discovered that if he wants to get money from the uh, public purse, he has to call what he is doing science. And since ever since then, people, many people believe that linguistics is a science. So uh, in the 60s, uh, uh, well, as I said before, yes, in the 60s, then we had the computer, and then anything that was worth doing had to be done with the computer. And so uh, this is why John Sinclair decided that if you want to do linguistics, you have to use a computer because otherwise there will be like 19th century. Let's not do that. So yes, uh, this is why corpus linguistics laid claim to science, uh, why it developed the methodology and why it is using the computer. I'm not saying that's wrong. We learned a lot of things from computer, from uh, corpus linguistics. And also when we do some corpus, some, some discourse studies, we always start with corpus linguistics. We look at the textual evidence, we make the computer find correlations between words and expressions, and then we start thinking, what does it actually mean? What, the, what is being said here? So just briefly, when I was a young linguist, this is what I used to do. Uh, uh, we worked with real language data, even in those days when I was uh, maybe about 26, 27, uh, we, follow, we followed the methods we were taught, uh, strictly followed the methods, yeah, I wouldn't do anything else. <coughs> we tried to identify elements, uh, classes of elements and their variants. So what is actually a word, the different uh, inflections of a word, do they belong to it? And uh, uh, or are they different words? We classify relations between elements. We categorize word order. We try to categorize the meaning of words. But I say here, we try to because that is something we couldn't do really in a scientific way. There is no scientific way to do it. We tried to categorize the function of the relations between words. Also, we couldn't do that because we had no idea of meaning. And we can then compare our findings to previous findings and we come up with some new category, something new had to be found in our uh, uh, approach. And then uh, uh, we would write a paper but we did not interpret what people say. So this was how I worked for a long time, but now I'm too old to do that. So how useful is uh, this kind of linguistics as I've just described it? Uh, and this might be interesting for uh, you, uh, the tra translation studies people. Uh, uh, that when I was, uh, working at my institution, uh, research institute. I was not involved in this project, so <coughs> I don't have to blame myself, but we can blame those who paid for this project, which altogether cost, well, at least 200 million euros. And it, it was, the idea was to translate without the need of post editing between the seven and then nine official languages of the European community as it was then, the predecessor of the European Union. And so that was, well, they thought, well, this should be easily done. We know so many rules now, 
due to the work of linguists and I, all the functions and all. And we, if we stuff that into a, a big grammar and then get the computer uh, to, to work on one text, it will easily translate it into another language. It never worked. It never worked. Uh, computers apparently are not interested in our rules. Uh, who knows why? Uh, probably a good thing. And there's another project, uh, the site project, Psych is, a, is taken from the word encyclopedia. This is how I got found. Psych. It's a knowledge base, a knowledge system based on facts and their relations, coded in a particular code that they invented, that extracted from real language texts. And uh, well, so far it's an American thing, and so far it cost about seven hundred million dollars. Uh, it's still somehow going on. Uh, apparently it was never closed completely down, but it was never seriously applied. So it was completely useless. It's not what people would do today. But then we have the miracle that even children learn language without, at least a native language, which without actually being taught. Uh, without being taught all these rules that I find in the grammar book, without even being taught exactly the meaning of words, but only by being talked to, by asking questions, by being corrected, by being told, but don't say that, say something else. And this is how, uh, how uh, normal people learn language. I think it's probably different when you learn a second or foreign language. Uh, then you have to learn certain rules and things like that. And I don't know how. Uh, so there is some reason in finding rules and looking at language uh, from a traditional linguistic perspective. But uh, for little children learning their mother tongue, they don't need it. Uh, I think they can easily get away without it. So uh, what does that tell us? Well, now. Of course, then in the 1980s, I, in, uh, artificial intelligence began to happen. Uh, now we do have these uh, large language module, models like GPT, Chat GPT, Lambda, GPT-3. Uh, uh, how do they manage uh, to deal with language? Did they learn the rules? Of course, of course not, no, no. The secret of them is uh, uh, the, this connectionism, this idea of connectionism realized uh, through complex neural networks. And then you feed these machines. Has Who of you has tried to uh, work with chat GPT? Anyone did already work with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's fun, it's fun, it's very fun. Uh, after a lot, come on, quite a lot. You'll see it later. Uh, so it's fed with billions of texts. For the next version of GPT-3, which will be GPT-4, they said they will put uh, one third of all the texts on the internet into uh, the database, which will be pretty big, I think. Uh, and uh, then you, uh, they try to establish the relationship between words by using statistics, frequency, co-occurrence, all statistically processed and this works quite well. Uh, often you think, well, these, this text could have been well, made, uh, uh, written by a human. And, but it's a huge, uh, what you, it's overlooked, it isn't all automatic. Uh, before it's uh, handed over to the users, there are, uh, well, uh, trainers, human trainers, who train it with uh, millions of questions and they have to answer, if they answer in a, uh, not, the, not what is expected, not what you want to hear, then it's being, the system is being told, you can't say that, you have to say that and so on. And we'll see that, we'll see that. So it's trained by, uh, be, uh, and it's trained against incorrect output. You mustn't say nasty things, you only must say the proper things. Uh, uh, not based on the findings, but it's not based on the findings of traditional linguistics, not at all. It's learning language like an infant. And uh, I mean, this is how, huh, that makes it interesting. 
So uh, for me, as you have found out by now, linguistics is primarily uh, the quest for me, the quest for meaning. I'm fascinated by meaning. How does it come? Uh, what, what is the meaning of something? How do we know? Or how can we approach this concept of meaning? Often we are not sure what a word or sentence means. This is uh, why people, I think, began to study languages. I mean, this is why people started thinking about language, because somehow, sometimes they couldn't understand what someone else was saying. Was it a, not really language what he was using, or what, what he was using? Well, they didn't know the words, perhaps, or they didn't understand the rules, or what was it? So uh, they, uh, when they weren't clear what it was, well, this is when they started thinking about language. And uh, this is where people, I think, began to study language. And this is when we have to learn. Uh, this is, I think, not yet the point. At that point, people always thought that words refer to things in nature. So if you have the word horse, you think they were, it refers to a horse that you find somewhere in the nature, a real horse. But it's only recently that, well, we have come to think about the meaning of words as not referring to what is out there in reality, in the reality as it really exists outside of discourse. But when we have found out that uh, what a word means, is just all that has been said about it. So what has been said about a horse, uh, that is our idea of a horse. Uh, for instance, uh, we know more of a, about horses than we see when we see a horse. We know that people can ride horses, but that's not what you see when you look at a horse. We know a lot, the meaning of horse extends far and how far it extends, well, that's up to us to decide how far we look. I guess there are thousands of books about horses, and they all contribute to what a horse is. And uh, when we want to find out what the meaning of horse is, we have to look and to read all these thousand books, or let a computer read them, and uh, and then uh, do a corpus linguistics analysis, and then we can think about the results and find, interpret the results and find out what the meaning of horse is. Horse, we say, well, do they really exist? Yes, really, but do they, does, I mean, are horses, how different are horses from donkeys and how different are they from zebras and those are kind of things to think about. That is, uh, and it's the decisions we made as humans uh, well, we don't call zebras horses. There's no decision that this has been made in, uh, the na in nature or by the scientists. Uh, they are in many ways very similar and uh, we could call them, give them just the same name. So uh, words do not refer to a discourse independent reality. Uh, they do not refer to reality the exact, when we, what we say refers to what we react to, what has been said before. We, uh, we always, when we say something, we take into account what has been said before about what we are talking about. The meaning of a word is what we have said and are saying about it. And uh, while we are saying it, we remember what has been said about it and we react to it either by accepting it or rejecting it. We'll see that. In the natural world, in the natural world, uh, there are, for instance, there are no mountains and no hills. There are perhaps, uh, we could have use a neutral term, uh, something like elevations, but whether something is a mountain or something with a hill is what we determine, that what we say. It's up to us, we could change. And if you look at, for instance, the difference between German and English, then you find that what for a 
uh, an English speaker is a hill, often is already a mountain for a German speaker. And uh, there are other examples uh, where the, uh, when you compare languages, that they categorize things, the things they make up, like mountains and, and uh, hills, uh, in different ways. So we create objects by talking about them. And this is why I think uh, depression is an interesting topic. So we have uh, soon come to depression. Uh, indeed, I will come to depression, I, to depression right away. Uh, 40 years ago, no one in China knew, had, uh, knew anything about words. The word. There was no word for depression, as Wang Fang told me. No. no. I mean, there was this word, yi yu jing, yi yu jing, yu jing. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, so, uh, and this came up later, later, much later. So now everybody knows it and thinks, well, depression really exists. So, yeah, so there must be such a thing as depression, otherwise, we wouldn't have a word for it. Well, well, who knows? Would there be uh, would there be depression if no one talked about? I mean, there are many languages uh, uh, where there is no word for depression yet. And uh, do they have depression? Do these people have to? De can they have depression or not? Would they? What, or how would we know if they have depression? What makes it? Well, how would we decide that? So there's no true meaning. And the meaning of depression is only what has been said about it. And we can believe it or not. And there is all meaning means, uh, all kinds of things have to be said about depression. <laughs> Does depression exist in a discourse independent world? This was the topic of a very good article by Louis Menand in the New Yorker in 2010 already. And this is a bit of a difficult sentence that he has there. Uh, psychologist uh, Irving Kirsch's conclusion that antidepressants are just fancy placebos. On, on Kirsch's calculation, the placebo effect, you believe that you are taking a pill that will make you feel better, and therefore you will feel better, wipes out the statistical difference between placebos and antidepressants. So it doesn't really state that you cannot, that there is no difference between placebos and antidepressants, only that the people who take instead of their antidepressants, they take a placebo, they uh, have the same effects as the people who are taking the antidepressants. And that means, uh, well, the depression is only in the mind. It's, People have been told there is such a thing as depression. People then think, some people, they have depression and they want to have, get their GP to prescribe them uh, antidepressants. And if it's a clever a GP, he will give them or she will give them placebos and they will feel a lot better after they have taken them. So uh, this is one way of looking at depression. Uh, there is, of course, another way, and and uh, it's uh, still well. This way of looking at depression still exists. There is the chemical imbalance theory of depression is dead, but that doesn't mean antidepressants don't work. That was an article in the Guardian uh, not long ago, half a year ago, and uh, you see uh, uh, there is. Apparently, nothing in our uh, in our uh, well uh, uh, brain that shows uh, that something in a person who is diagnosed with depression differs from a person who is not who is free from depression, who is diagnosed as being free from depression. So it's not something chemical. Depression isn't something chemical. What else is it if it's not chemical? Uh, that's the question. And well. For me, I will give you the, the, uh, my answer and my interpretation. My interpretation now, depression is uh, uh, something that exists in discourse 
but not outside this course. <coughs> so uh, if you look at uh, the internet, which I often like to do is <coughs> you go to Google and you find there are 95 occurrences of the sentence, there is no such thing as depression. On the other hand, there are 170, 187 occurrences of uh, depression as real. So uh, this is uh, where it's very difficult to know what's real, what is not real. So uh, learning from Wang Fang, uh, I don't know, but for Fang, Fang Wang. Uh, 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 yes, uh, uh, many years ago, how many years ago? 20 years ago? Is that always 20 years? No. No, no, it's not 20 years. It's maybe 15, 10, 12. Uh, she, she, her PhD thesis was about depression. Uh, it, well, not about depression, of course. We don't know what depression is. But what about what he, people said about depression? And uh, that is very interesting. And she did a diachronic study. So she looked at uh, the, uh, the texts of different phases she had five phases or six phases, five years lasting each. And you could see that people in each phase were saying different things about depression. So the, the meaning evolved. Uh, oh, there were parallel meanings. Of course, uh, meanings never die. I mean, it's still there. It's still there somewhere in the discourse. But uh, the main uh, uh, focus of depression, or the main focus of what people said about depression, that has changed. And so she did a, a corpus linguistic study, uh, and uh, uh, but she went beyond a corpus linguistics because she, then she looked at the evidence of all the public of all the sentences in certain newspapers between 1985 and in two, year 2000, and then she read through them and she found out what was most topical about what they were saying. And what were they saying in, in 1986? One of the differences between being depressed and having a clinical depression is that with the first, a kind friend and a bit of effort can help you to pull yourself together. But depression is something different. It leaves you entirely devoid of inclination or ability to do anything about it, whatever the incentives. So this was the way they talked about it in those days. They said, well, we have first have to establish what this depression is. This was also uh, when it was not quite clear yet what depression should be. So they say it's not just being depressed, it's much more, it's much, 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 more, much graver than just being depressed. But a few years later, then we read depression is due or at least consistently associated with chemical changes in the brain. And the drugs revert the chemical changes. Well, this is what they thought in these years between uh, uh, 1990 and 1995. Uh, that was the general tenor of what, uh, what Wang Fang read in those days. Uh, so they said there is a chemical imbalance. That was uh, the, the word of the day in those days. And then a bit later, uh, you have, uh, that is from 1995 to 2000, you have depression is associated with changes in the brain's neurotransmitters, uh, pathways which carry chemical messages between the cells. So they don't talk anymore about the chemical imbalance, they talk about neurotransmitters. This is when, of course, uh, uh, the uh, brain science took off and, and everybody wanted seemed to know what's happening in the brain when they look at it neurotransmitters. And finally, in the last phase she had, that was from 90, uh, no, it was not the last phase. Uh, that was a phase from uh, 1995 to 2000. Depression is a genuine debilitating problem for many people and it's a complete misconception that it only strikes people with poor social backgrounds who are out of work and have financial problems. Well, that is something I never really believed in. I thought, uh, the only people who can afford going to see a psychiatrist are those with lots of money, not the poor people. So uh, the poor people, the poor people we, we don't know whether the poor people have it. And then we have in 2006, uh, 
depression uh, is like a void, a chasm, as though you have been stripped of every feeling. So it's becoming, uh, the concept is becoming more psychological. People uh, look at it from a psychological perspective. And then uh, they finally realize, well, we don't know what it is. Marjorie Wallace, chief executive of the mental health charity, saying, said, depression is a complex and challenging condition that remains poorly understood. Uh, we welcome any scientific contribution to our understanding of this illness. So the, the, the belief that we now know what depression is, that was gone at that time, is coming back. And according to scientists, that was the last one that I uh, uh, then uh, found uh, in my punk's thesis. According to scientists, depression is good for us. Finally, something positive, no, something positive. They suggest that medicating depression is as if a disease stops embracing our miserable side and removes the motivation to change our lives for the better. So apparently this person thinks that uh, if we have depression, we feel motivated to change the world for uh, our lives for the better. I'm not sure that I would agree with that. But my question is, what makes depression so attractive that many people want to be diagnosed with it? When I was still teaching in Birmingham, when I had students before they handed, uh, when, when the uh, term paper was due to be handed in, they came to me uh, with a notice saying uh, uh, that they unfortunately had caught depression and they need another week or two to finish and to write their thesis. So I think it's nice to, I mean, uh, it, re it uh, removes responsibility for, from you, uh, when you are diagnosed with depression, with depression, you don't have to have guilt feelings about being depressed. You know, it's not your fault. It's real, a real disorder, and uh, the antidepressant or the DP will do something about it. So actually, uh, uh, yes, it's better to be diagnosed with. Uh, with uh, depression than uh, well, having feelings of guilt about them. Well, so I, I, I mean, I didn't know the answer to this question, so I had to ask uh, G, uh, Chat GBT because this, uh, this uh, chatbot is supposed to tell her the truth. And so I asked it, when people cannot pull themselves together any longer, does it help? Uh, how does it help them to know that they have depression and what makes depression so attractive that people want to be diagnosed with it? I was a bit disappointed by the response because the response was obviously uh, uh, well, uh, edited in some way by, by uh, uh, the training program that uh, ChatGPT tend to, uh, it has jet GBT has a very definite opinion about depression, and I read it to you. When someone is experiencing symptoms of depression and is struggling to function, receiving a diagnosis of depression, a di receiving a diagnosis of depression can provide some relief and understanding of what they are going through. So this is why it's good. Well, it may be good for people to be diagnosed with it, knowing that what they are experiencing is common mental health condition can help alleviate any feelings of shame or guilt that they may have experiencing. It can also help them to understand that their symptoms are not a personal failure for, or weakness, but rather a treatable medical condition. And then it really uh, uh, reprimanded me. It is not accurate to say that people want to be diagnosed with depression or find it attractive. Depression is a serious mental health condition that is, can greatly affect a person's well-being, relationships, and daily functioning. People who struggle with depression may feel overwhelmed, hopeless, and unable to enjoy things they once did. So uh, it certainly has a message to tell us, uh, this chatbot. So uh, now, when we look at uh, the internet as a corpus, 
than uh, how do people negotiate uh, the meaning of the word depression when they talk with each other? When someone says depression is a very, re uh, very real and treatable illness, and, and then someone else says depression is not a real condition, and then you find depression is a response to hormonal imbalance, and then you find also depression is not simply the result of chemical imbalance. Depression, someone says, is a feeling of sadness. Uh, depression is more, more than, someone says, more than a feeling of their sadness. Depression is not a feeling, it's an illness. Depression is not completely understood. Depression is a disease with multiple causes. Uh, depression, depression is not, depression is not a disease. So we find all kinds of things and they all contribute to the meaning, all taken together, all we find is what depression is. Uh, and we can choose for ourselves what we like and what we don't like for, for our own personal individual concept of depression. Depression in discourse, this is what depression means in discourse. In the English discourse, as I looked at it last year. So, discourse, we construct our reality. Discourse is not giving us the reality of the real world, of the world outside. In discourse, we talk with each other and then we construct the the world that is the real world for us, that it's not the world outside. And in this discourse, people say all kinds of things. For, for some, depression exists, for some, it doesn't exist. So, uh, getting there. Uh, words, I'm currently at slide 17 of 25. So there's hope, there's a light at the, tunnel, at the end of the tunnel. So, uh, Words, sentences, texts mean. We make them mean. We make them mean by talking about them. Meaning is not an object of science. We can never figure out, a computer can never figure out uh, uh, what uh, uh, depression is, the word, what the word depression means. Uh, we have to look at what is being said about depression, and then we have to find our own interpretation of what that means. Meaning only comes by interpreting what is there. The meaning of a word, a phrase, a text segment, a text is all that has been said about it or concerning it. Meaning is only a discourse. Uh, it she keeps changing as long as we talk about it because we always disagree. I mean, discourse exists because somebody says something and then then somebody else says, well, I don't agree with it. I say somewhere. And so discourse goes on. But people are always disagreeing with each other. They always, every contribution of discourse changes a bit what has been said before. So meaning is not fixed. Uh, we can always change it. Therefore, discourse, the sum of what we say cannot be an object of science. Or am I wrong? In corpus linguistics, John Sinclair would definitely say I'm wrong. Uh, because he believed in what uh, J.R. first said, meaning by collocation is an abstraction on the syntagmatic level and is not directly concerned with the conceptual uh, idea approach to the meaning of words. So uh, the conceptual or idea approach to the meaning of words is what you find in a dictionary. It tells you what a word means, that is the idea that the word gives you. This is what we look up in a dictionary. And he says, well, let's replace this idea approach by a mathematical or formal approach, a statistical approach. Let's look what we find in the corpus. And there we find that, uh, well, with a word of this, uh, depression, you always find in the context other words, which is true. But uh, so you can, uh, well, can even generate a, some kind of a formal statement of uh, concerning these uh, these collocations, and you can say, well, this formal statement that is representing the meaning of the word depression. 
Well, yes, uh, <coughs> and it doesn't mean anything. Uh, this form of statement is not something that we can understand and the computer can't understand it either. And the other problem is uh, in corpus linguistics, the very big problem is when they do their statistical analysis of what is being said in the discourse, all they can look at is the word in the middle, depression, and five words to the left and five words to the right. And lots of things are happening outside of that window. And this is what they never can capture. So uh, first, meaning by collocation is something that can be calculated, but it cannot be understood. It's cannot, uh, it doesn't tell us anything. It's science. And it's not uh, something that we can understand. Meaning for me is a discourse construct. It evolves through unpredictable paraphrases. It is not fixed. So corpus linguistics is a study of meaning. For John Sinclair, corpus linguistics was to turn language. Was, uh, corpus linguistics was to turn language studies into a science. That's what he wanted to do. So he followed JR first and replace the study of meaning by collocation analysis. But I don't think it gives us meaning. He was the first to use a computer for an empirical analysis of big data, and thus he seemed to generate objectively some results. But we won't discuss now really what objectivity means. I don't think uh, that would lead us anywhere. Underneath, however, Intuition played always a big role in, the, in, in sorting the data. The statistics is not objective. We can get uh, corpus linguists now use, I think, 20 or 30 different uh, statistics programs, uh, and they choose the one that delivers the results they want to have. So uh, it's uh, far from being objective. The study of meaning is uh, not looking at uh, statistical data, but interpreting what people say. And that is not objective. That is, of course, someone's opinion. And you have to look at these opinions and then make up your own mind. So meaning is not fixed. So and uh, it's not just uh, uh, that uh, this is a new invention. It's, it's a bit older than that. Uh, so there was Zhuangzi, uh, uh, a great philosopher, my favorite Chinese philosopher. And, uh, uh, and he knew it all along. And that was 2,300 or 2,004. What does it say here? 350 between, yeah. So about uh, 2,400 years ago. And he said something that looks very Chinese to me, so I can't read it. But uh, there is, fortunately, uh, there are translations. Uh, and uh, one translation that I like, they're different. They're very different. Uh, some say human speech is more than the blowing of air. Uh, so just uh, producing noise. Speech has something of which it speaks, something which it refers to. But this is in quotation marks. It's, uh, when it now, uh, it does, uh, so it's something that some uh, it's something that someone has said, and then Zhuangzi hears it and says, "No, no, no, uh, yes." But what it refers to that is not fixed. It's peculiarly unfixed. So is there really anything it refers to? Is there any dispute, or is there no dispute? And so what we have in discourse is dispute. We dispute uh, 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 these uh, uh, the meanings. We dispute what people say about depression. So the Tao, of course, doesn't speak. It's only by discussing things, the Tao, if we take it as a natural word, uh, including heaven and whatever is spiritual word. So the Tao, of course, doesn't speak. It's only by discussing things that we humans can make sense of the word outside of the unspoken word of the Tao. That is where he, of course, differs from uh, Lao Tzu, who says it's nowhere, uh, it doesn't bring, get us anywhere talking about the word. Uh, but uh, Jiangsu is different. He says, well, 
let's talk about it. It's 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 fun talking about it. it. Doesn't get us anywhere, but it's fun. So negotiating meaning. What does it mean? Uh, someone tells us what he or she thinks depression is, and she reacts or he reacts to what has been said, and then he or she interprets or paraphrases what he or she accepts, and he or she tells us what he or she does not accept. So I give you two examples. The one is Harry, this is all taken from, from the internet. So uh, 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 this is really how discourse happens. Harry Potter's author J.K. Rowling once said, depression isn't just being a bit sad, it's feeling nothing. It's not wanting to be alive anymore. And then the other person, well, refers to it by saying, yes, depression is a real illness, but there are ways to heal from it. So she's, uh, 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 she disagrees with uh, Rowling, uh, saying uh, uh, it's the, there is a way out of depression. This is what Rowling for Rowling apparently does not exist. And there's another example that I found. But isn't it accepted that depression is genetic? If so, isn't it just a matter of time before they can discover the gene that causes uh, the disease? Yes, there's evidence that depression has substantial heritability, but this does not mean that depression is a disease. So there may be some condition that we call depression, but how should, why, why should it be a disease? It's just something very normal. Uh, and it may be genetic after all, but, but it's normal and it's not necessarily disease. So uh, this is not what you get by looking at uh, what corpus linguists do, what corpus linguists do, but by looking at uh, 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 the abstraction on the syntagmatic level, looking at collocations, that is something that you must, uh, well, analyze, uh, must try to understand, and then you can, well, you can interpret it. So here, uh, you are always, when we are talking with each other, we are interpreting what the other person has said. And we can accept it, or we can reject it, or we can modify it. Here, it's mostly modified. So uh, uh, most of our interesting discourse is, well, interpreting what the speaker before us has said or what other speakers before us have said. That is actually when you pay attention in a group and you have a discussion, then when somebody then, uh, comes up, uh, also wants to say something, they will, well, they will talk, they will interpret what the other people have said. And they will accept it to some extent. Yes, you always have to some extent accept it. Other, yeah, otherwise, you will be the black sheep. Black sheep out. I know where you will, I think. And, uh, and so they will uh, say something friendly, but then they will say, but you are absolutely wrong here. So, so uh, well, uh, then when I come to terms to it, uh, linguistics and science. Uh, on par with the natural sciences. What about corpus linguistics? Uh, finding eternal law that govern language, finding language universals, that has never, never been the target of corpus linguistics. That is what this other great linguist, Noam Chomsky, has been doing, looking for universals. And for a while, he thought, he yeah, found about 30 universals, something that were common to all human languages. And later they find, found out none of them really existed. It was all uh, uh, in the minds. Finding the elements, the relations between the elements and the rules of painting, that's a start what we can do. Finding the true meaning of science, no, there is no true meaning. Playing with statistics, no, no, why? But uh, making sense of what people have said, yes, that is, I think, what we have to do. We can use all the uh, tools and methods of corpus linguistics and can look at them, but we have to read them and then we have to, uh, to uh, interpret it, the result. Uh, studying discourse as an evolving human-made or collective organism compiled 
composed of all our utterances over time. Yes, our task as linguists, I said that before, interpreting and helping others. So this course is a human fabrication. It's not something that exists in real nature. We make it up and we know, never know what is being said next. Meaning is not fixed. This course, uh, is not governed by laws of nature, it evolves randomly, randomly. So we don't count, there's no rule that uh, nothing tells us what's going to be said next. It forms a contingent fabric of intertextual links. Well, I could talk for an hour about intertextual links, but I won't bore you to death, uh, coming to an end, two more slides only. Uh, in this course, we construct concrete, ideational and relational things, mountains, depression, or signs, and classifications, we call like a feeling or an illness or an imbalance, a world that is not, uh, 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 that is not, but it looks to us uh, like a mirror image of the real world. It's not the real world. It's not the natural world out there. It just looks like it. For us, it is uh, the real world because it's the world that we, all, uh, the world that we can talk about it. We don't know anything about the real world outside. We only can talk about uh, what uh, what has been talked about. Uh, so uh, a lot of our talking is making sense of what has been said and discourse then, but gives us the freedom of a creative intelligence because we are, can say what we want. We can uh, try out our creativity by saying something that no one else has expected. We should be careful though. If we say something that's too strange that nobody will listen to us. Uh, that happens quite often to me. So, so uh, the qualitative level of corpus work, that is what I want to propose. Interpretation is a collective enterprise. Everyone does their own interpretation and then we compare the interpretations and maybe we can uh, improve on them uh, but we don't have to agree, and that's a good thing. So we can have different opinions, and I hope we are going to keep our different opinions on what depression is. So it's what we all do all the time when we are in the conversation. Uh, linguists can do a bit more. They have some. They have learned some things how to do things. Uh, they can uh, sort the textual evidence. They can, for instance, sort text genres, newspaper, radio, social network, WeChat, and so on. They can look at uh, levels of talking, official, private, academic, educator, and so on. They can have speaker background, they can take into uh, account speaker background, background and gender. Gender, of course, very important. All these seven, 27 different genders we now, now have, uh, uh, we and study the intertextual links. And that is very important. Uh, intertextuality, I think, is the best uh, way uh, to, well, to uh, understand meaning. Uh, to what is a, we have to look at, uh, when we find an utterance, to what exactly does this utterance react? And then we will know a lot more, uh, know better how to interpret this utterance. And then we can look at what is the reaction to this utterance. So we have to look at what people actually say, right? I mean, it's uh, if you look at uh, at uh, academic articles, linguistic articles. Of course, uh, in my career, I was forced to write too many academic articles. And uh, well, what happens is that I look at other people's arc uh, articles. I uh, make a note of what I don't like about them. I criticize them and then I put it into my paper and then somebody else writes another article and criticizes what I say. And this is how linguistic gets better by the day. And there's always uh, plenty of room for improvement. So uh, the objective is a contest of different interpretations, but certainly not a winner. We don't want to have a situation where everybody has to believe uh, one dogma. And now, uh, this is apparently my last slide. Uh, 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 language means people keep creating meaning in discourse by talking about the world 
uh, we live in and by the challenges we meet. People are free to say what they want. They are in charge of discourse, they fabricate it. Uh, that is different in the natural world. Uh, then uh, uh, there we have the laws of nature and they tell the things how to behave. But we humans are free. We can, uh, uh, we are not under any, uh, any dogma. We can do what we want. Discourse is not an object of nature. We can talk about meaning, but we cannot calculate it. Discourse evolves over time as an organism that is structured by the intertextual links between our utterances. And thus there is a patterning in language in discourse that we can observe. Uh, to make sense of a discourse item, people will question, discuss, or interpret the evidence, this evidence in artful, creative ways. And there is never a true or a final interpretation. Philological methods and corpus lingui is the tools. They always play a role and they're important. But then we have to go on from that and start uh, reading the texts and making sense of them. So uh, the future of, of a corpus linguistics, merging methodical quantitative analysis with qualitative, creative, interpretive sense making. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Thanks a lot. Thank you for finishing right on time. That's really great. I think uh, it's a really, really inspiring talk uh, about meanings of language, which probably is the most important thing for, uh, for translators. I think today probably Wolfgang shows us in a very rich way that if we want to keep, if we want to achieve, if we want to um, uh, understand the meanings of language, how many complex factors we need to put into consideration. So, and also we know the importance of interpretation and importance of how to make sense of people say. So what it really means. So I think these are really uh, significant for translators as well. So uh, do you mind if we have a brief discussion if well, our uh, students have some questions? questions? Yeah, uh, do we have any questions from the site first? Probably I want to ask any questions. Any question? Okay, Constantine, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. This was, this was brilliant. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. And uh, can I be devil's advocate? Can, can I be Dave, devil's advocate? Oh, sure, yeah. Oh, because, please. yeah, I think this slide is very good. I kept thinking, oh, actually what you are talking about is what's going on in, in uh, uh, deep learning nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's uh, okay. I'm, I'm going to put my computer scientist hat. Yeah. And uh, yeah, okay. Uh, in uh, deep learning, with especially what's going on now, I'm not talking about what was about five years ago. Yeah. I'm talking about BERT models where the context yeah. starts picking up, uh, even chat GTP. We don't know what meaning is. It's a vector of 1000 numbers that depend on the context. We give more and more context. Uh, and uh, this meaning evolves, and somehow we use this vector of numbers to achieve something. Answer questions, uh, give answers to, to judge, judge GTP. Um, the only difference from what you're saying, the only thing I disagree is that the meaning cannot be uh, computed. In the context of, of uh, uh, deep learning computer science, we have these mathematical models that uh, will give us a number and we don't know what they mean, but they achieve something and they keep evolving. So I'm just wondering what, how you see as a two different um, uh, uh, domains. Or two different domains or, or two different perspectives. I yeah. mean, this is a very interesting uh, uh, topic. And actually, I mean, this is why I then started to look at uh, these new large language models. Uh, because they apparently don't need any of the stuff that linguists for long times have developed. Uh, but uh, meaning, uh, I mean, I think apart from very few people who have been involved in Lambda, uh, uh, nobody claims uh, that uh, 
these computers have any idea what they are talking about. And uh, they don't have in, uh, developed a, a, a consciousness in any way or self-awareness or what they have called then with Lambda, they've called it sentience. Uh, no, I don't believe in that. Uh, 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 not yet because, uh, uh, well, it's too early and I wouldn't rule it out uh, for the next 10 years. That might be there actually in, in 10 years. And again, I think uh, I would like to compare it to the way children learn and uh, how their language learning affects the growth of a self-awareness or consciousness in these children. I mean, uh, what I've read about uh, uh, these large language models is uh, that there are a lot of modules which still are missing in order to develop these machines to a state where they have, uh, well, where they don't, well, uh, say so much nonsense and where they, where uh, you have the impression, uh, you have the impression that they know what they are talking about. Like with a child growing maybe uh, three or four years old, you think, well, uh, uh, she knows already uh, uh, this, or she knows why she's saying this. Uh, the, we are still, whether we ever get there in the state with these machines, uh, I think, yes, we will, but uh, not everybody agrees. Uh, most people probably don't. But I think uh, meaning is something that uh, we, uh, those who have the self awareness, the sentience, this, uh, uh, well, intentionality, uh, we who, who have it, we struggle with meaning, we talk about meaning, we search for meaning, we interpret what is being said. And uh, if, if that is the, if that is, we do it because we have this uh, intentionality in us. And until people are uh, is, well, in this way, intentional or self-aware, they will not struggle about it in the struggle with meaning in the way that intentional people will. Of course, we are not all the time intentional. I mean, we, we, it's a lot of effort and burns a lot of calories. This deep thinking and deep learning. And, and so we don't do it all the time and we just react automatically when we talk to each other, when we st uh, stand uh, uh, together uh, in a pub and uh, drink our pints, then we don't actually uh, well, pay a lot of attention to the meaning of what is being said. We just react automatically most of the time. But uh, it's only humans who can do more, uh, who can to, who can uh, then, uh, well, start questioning themselves. So, uh, what what is this really? They are talking about this depression thing, and uh, someone uh, who is in a hurry and and has to get his uh, uh, an extension to finish his paper. They will run to the next GP and said, "I need a paper telling that I can show my uh, my professor uh, that I need another two weeks because I'm in a deep depression." And uh, he doesn't care whether he really has a depression or not so much. So I think yeah, there are differences, but meaning, uh, as you say, and I didn't say that, uh, as you say, uh, I think it presupposes a certain self-awareness which machines do not yet have. And therefore these machines don't deal with meaning. They, uh, they are machines that process input into output. Thank you. So I think the concept of intentionality probably matters a lot here. Yeah, thank you. Um, any other question from the floor? Okay, good.
Thank you so much, Professor Wolfgang. Thank you for your great and excellent speech. Uh, well, according to your presentation, the things happened between us influence what we said. Uh, for example, in China, too, 20 years ago, we don't have the word depression. Maybe that's because we don't have the articles or papers describe it. So we don't talk about depression. And uh, linguistics studied what people said, not the reality. But um, from my understanding, it seems that there's a gap between the things uh, happened around us and the reality, which is the object of the science. I was just wondering from your perspective, is that right? And uh, if that gap doesn't exist, does that mean in that extreme case, the discourse is an object of science? Well, uh, actually, I mean, there has been uh, a discussion that you also see in Jiangsu, uh, whether uh, uh, discourse is part of the Tao. And he said, uh, as I understand him, and of course, uh, there are so many ways to understand Jiangsu. Uh, he, he, uh, I think he says, well, uh, it makes more fun to look at discourse as not being part of the Tao. So it's not a, it's not something that's out there in the it's a part of nature. And uh, I think also uh, uh, it is. I mean, it's not just uh, Jiangsu who has uh, his problems with relating reality, the outer reality, to uh, to language. Uh, if you look at what is happening in the philosophy of science over the last, well, 50 or years or so, you find that the trust in, uh, in our ability or the uh, methodology of science to ever get us closer to really uh, coming to terms with reality, to really finding out about what is real and what is not real, that this trust uh, has attenuated, has become weaker as much. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore in many ends. If you look at the current developments, for instance, in uh, uh, in what it called oh God, my, my, my head. Uh, uh, there are lots of areas, uh, for instance, in uh, in particle uh, particle uh, physics, uh, where. There are divide, people are divided. Uh, it's not so easy to claim. I mean, 100 years ago, everybody was convinced there's such a thing as electrons. And today, people would say, well, we have developed uh, tools uh, to tell us if what is happening there is an electron or not. But it's only the, the tool that creates the electron. Uh, what is really there, we don't know. So we can uh, record uh, an electron, let's say either as a particle or a wave function, uh, because we have a tool to do it. But it doesn't tell us anything about the reality of an electron. It can become something quite different. Quantum mechanics today say, well, what we can look at is are the observations of people uh, well checking out what is happening. So we can see where well, there is this chap who has looked at his tool and he found an electron as a wave. And there is this chap who has looked at his tool and who found uh, 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 that there is just a wave. And uh, so what we are looking at now in quantum uh, theory is, what people tell us about their observations. It's not what there is real, real. So we look at the discourse about these realities and not at reality. And I think this is 
in recent uh, science philosophy becoming more and more the case for the rest of physics and chemistry. So I think that uh, while of course for our normal life uh, uh, we are dealing with reality all the time and uh, uh, when I see this I have no doubt that this is the cup uh, uh, that I have in my hand uh, but uh, this the question of what a cup is is a question that is not solved by looking at this cup but it's what a cup is is what has been said about cups and uh, this thing falls under the category of what has been said about cups so uh, it seems to us we are talking about cups we are actually talking about what people have said about these things. And uh, I think this is, well, makes things more complicated and we don't need it for everyday life, not at all. But when we come to think about, uh, well, similar things, uh, how we can distinguish one thing from another thing and how we can, uh, maybe uh, distinguish one disorder from another disorder, then there's not much else we have to, can look at than what we are being told uh, in discourse, what people say about it, whether they are experts or whether they are people who have feel uh, like they have depression or something like that. So uh, it's not in normal situations that the question arises. Uh, is our uh, is what we say a mirror of reality there is a very good book by uh, richard rorty uh, language uh, no the mirror of reality the, the, uh, i think a mirror uh, the, uh, richard rorty is well, that's a pretty old book. It's already 50 years old or 60 years old. And, and, uh, but uh, it's one of the early ones in, uh, in <clears throat> philosophy that, well, asks the question, what's the relationship is between reality and language? And I think over recent years, it's what makes me fascinated by language or why I'm so fascinated in language is that uh, to, to see how we can live with a, in a reality that we have created ourselves by talking about it and how this reality that we create by talking about it uh, it's also called constructionism social constructionism how this reality is actually related perhaps to a reality out there, a reality that would also exist if we didn't talk about it. Thank you very much for your answer to this question. Thanks for the questions. Uh, sorry, can I, uh, can I see whether we have a, any questions online? Okay, good. Okay, so we have one question from Roxana who's watching online. And she's asking, if meaning keeps changing as we talk about it, then is there any hope for distinguishing between fake and real, between truth and delusional, for instance, on social media? And if there is, how do we do it? Oh, interesting question. Well, I, uh, hopefully uh, uh, there is no, uh, it's not to be expected that at some point we can distinguish between the proper meaning and the not proper meaning. Uh, and uh, this new recent talk about fake news is, uh, I think, absolute rubbish because uh, we never know. I mean, look at what the people tell us uh, when they, uh, uh, well, uh, try to validate what is being said, whether it's true or not true. It's uh, just as arbitrary as what has been said before and uh, it doesn't make anything right or wrong i mean uh, uh, i think uh, well to say what we mustn't say we mustn't uh, uh, say anything that 
other people would regard as fake news means that we are moving into a totalitarian system and I don't like that. I think it's our freedom as human beings to say what we want to and then other people can disagree with it and that's good and we can discuss it. But to say, well, I'm an institution that tells you whether what you say is right or wrong, I think that takes us very much into a world where I don't want to live. <laughs> that's a, that's a <laughs> good one. Good answer. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, because we have some students who need to have a, a class from four to six, so probably we will uh, conclude the talk today. But if you have any questions that you want to discuss with uh, Professor Wolfgang, so shall we? Uh, give your email oh, to sure, our yeah. students yeah. Wanted, yeah yeah and also thank you very much for thank your time you. today and have a nice evening thank you, thank you. Bye.